One of the things we do in our family, haven't been doing it lately, but we try to remember to do it at dinner time around the table, is to ask the question, what's been your favorite part of the day? What's been your favorite part of the day? And so we'll kind of go around and it's a way to share how our day went and what has been our favorite part of the day and why it's been our favorite part of the day. But I have another question for you this morning. What's been your favorite part of this past week? What's been your favorite part of the week? What should be the favorite part of any week? Sunday. And Sunday, not because you're running away from the world. It's one thing to run away from something and you go somewhere else. It's another thing to go somewhere else because that's where you want to be. I remember when we left New York, one of my mentors who's gone on to glory now told me, he says, uh, I pray that you're not leaving New York just to run away from New York, but you're going somewhere. I said, no, I'm going somewhere. But what is your favorite part of the week? What ought to be your favorite part of the week? And you say, some of you heard said Sunday. The question is, what should be the favorite part of Sunday? Now should be the favorite part. And that's not a commentary on me. It's a commentary on this. If anyone who is standing in the pulpit this morning throughout the world is preaching and teaching the unadulterated word of God, whether I was in the pulpit or not in my previous ministries, my favorite part was this part of Sunday, is to hear the word of God. Because this is God's word. This is not the word of man. And Paul said to the Thessalonian believers that you did not receive it as the word of men, but you received it as what it is, the very word of God. And that's why we sit under the teaching of the word of God. This has to be the highlight of our week. And I ask many people also sometimes, what's your favorite book of the Bible? And you each have it. My seminary professor, Prof. Howie Hendricks, used to say, you should never have a favorite book of the Bible. It's one unit, though some of us do. And I always encourage people to say, my favorite book of the Bible is the book I'm in at that time. And I'm amazed, to be honest with you, that people who have their favorite books of the Bible, whether it's from Old Testament, New Testament, that the Gospels, one of the four Gospels is not up on the list. There's nothing like hearing the word of God, hearing from God. God has spoken, and he has not stuttered. God has spoken loud and clear in the Bible, but also to hear specifically, if you're a believer, what are you called? A Christian. What's the root of that word? Christ. What joy it is to not only hear the word of God, but to hear about the Christ whom you follow, the Christ who paid your debt on the cross that you couldn't pay. The gospels has to be up on the top. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the direct eyewitness account of the life, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension and promise of his return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, if somebody asks you when you walk out that door, what's your favorite book? You better say Luke. So turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. As you turn there, if you didn't get an opportunity to grab uh, from the front, I see they were grabbed, so that's good, because you're going to need some of these sheets as we go through this study together. And I pray this morning as we turn to the Gospel of Luke, I pray this every morning in my study on Sunday morning, that God would use me as his instrument as his vessel to do three things, to instruct your mind, to ignite your heart, and to invite your will. That we would be instructed from the scripture in our minds, that we would be ignited in our hearts, that our wills would be invited to respond to the message which we have heard. You cannot listen Read, study, memorize, and meditate on the Word of God without responding to it. It was given to us not for our information, but for our transformation. So with that in mind, let's look at our text in Luke chapter 22 as we go verse by verse, and we're nearing the end of this marvelous gospel. Beginning in verse 54 that our brother beautifully read. I want to put the text before you yet again as we study it 
this morning. Verse 54 of Luke 22. Then they seized him and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house, and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. We find ourselves in the narrative of the Passion Week of Jesus Christ, Thursday night into Friday morning, the day of his crucifixion. Jesus had just celebrated the Passover with his disciples in what's known as the Upper Room Discourse, that last most intimate time he spent with the Twelve. And in celebrating the Passover, he established the Lord's Supper. And he said, this blood is a covenant in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. And in the light of that, he said to them that somebody is going to betray me. And none of the disciples had any idea who that was. They were asking each other even. Imagine three years of intimate fellowship, relationship, and friendship with the master, Jesus Christ, all 12 of them together, and no one had any idea that it was going to be Judas. And on the heels of that, on this most intimate night when the Lord institutes the Lord's Supper, they start arguing about who's the greatest. And Jesus reminds them, quoting from Isaiah 53, this same night, Thursday night, quoting from Isaiah 53, that he was to be numbered, Jesus was, with the transgressors. He would die on the cross as a substitute for sinners between two thieves. And then we see, as we saw last time a couple of weeks ago, that intense moment in time when the Son of Man the second member of the Trinity, is in the Garden of Gethsemane praying so intensely to his Father. And he said there in his prayer, Father, remove this cup from me. What cup? The cup, as we said, represented the wrath of Almighty God. The Son is praying to the Father, whom he was with from eternity past, now in his earthly state, in his incarnate state, Remove the cup of your wrath from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And as he's praying, we saw that Judas comes with the troops. As we said, there's about 600 with the religious leaders and the troops. And he kisses Jesus to betray him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's where our text picks up in our account this morning. The main plot, as we understand it, from the Gospel of Luke, is Christ. Christ's trials, especially as we move into the trials that Jesus is about to face. That is the main plot of this narrative. But what we're about to study this morning is another subplot, that of Peter. But we have to keep in mind that as we study Peter this morning, that he is a subplot to the greater narrative, which is about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's going to be on trial. How do we know that Christ is the main plot and Peter is a subplot? Let me give you four reasons before we get into our text. We have to understand this so we don't lose sight of what Luke is trying to do here. Four reasons why Jesus and his trials, which he is about to face, is the main plot, and Peter is just a subplot, what we're going to study this morning. First reason. Because of the historical context, because of the historical context, P- 
Peter's denials that we're supposed to, we're going to study this morning, they're interwoven in the trials of Jesus. They actually happen historically. Peter denies Jesus these three times as Jesus is on trial. If you take out the white sheet that you got in the front, so I can demonstrate this for you clearly. You can keep this as a bookmark if you want in your Bible. As we study the next two, three Sundays as well, the trials of Jesus, this will come in very handy. The part where there's a chart, the six mock trials of Jesus. Jesus faces six trials, as we will see. They're not all recorded by the Gospel of Luke. You'll see the ones there that are recorded by Luke that we are studying. There are three religious trials and three civil trials. But Peter's trials occur in the midst of Christ's religious trials. His first denial happens when Jesus is before Annas, the high priest. His second and third denials happen. Peter denies Christ as Peter is, as Jesus is led from Annas to the other high priest, Caiaphas. So these are happening, as you'll see in your chart, Peter's three denials interwoven in the trials of Jesus. The whole thrust of Luke is these are the trials of Jesus. And while the spotlight is on Jesus, there's another subplot spotlight. What's going on with Peter as Jesus is on trial? The second reason we know Christ is the main plot of our narrative is because of the literary context. The literary context. I showed you that the trials of Jesus and the denials of Peter are interwoven historically. But being that they're interwoven historically in sequential order, as it were, as you see in your chart, Luke doesn't put it in that way. As we study Luke, I've told you, Luke's gospel is not in the sequential narrative. Yet nonetheless, Luke falls under 2 Timothy 3.16, right? All scriptures breathed out by God. This is divinely inspired. So it wasn't, oops, I made a mistake. It's not in sequential order. Though we know from the aim of the gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 1, that he was going to make an accurate historical account as he studied this and presented the testimony about Jesus. But the literary context in terms of how it's set up in his gospel here, though Peter's denials are interwoven with Christ's trials, what Luke does here, he talks about Peter's denial in one section as if it was on its own. Why? Because once that's over, he wants to bring back the spotlight on all of the trials that Jesus has to face on the way to Golgotha. That's Luke's intent. That's how we know his focus is on Christ. The third reason we know that the main plot is Christ and that Peter is just a subplot is the audience. The audience. Peter, for example, as we will see this morning, he caves in to a servant girl. While Jesus, in contrast to Peter, is set up as a contrast here. Luke is doing this intentionally to show that while Peter caves in and denies the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ before his civil court in his religious court, he never denounces his true identity, that he is truly who he had claimed to be all along, the Son of Man. And fourthly, we know that this is all about Christ, secondarily about Peter, because of how it all ends, which we will see at the end of our study, because of how it all ends. So let's look at this subplot in our text of Peter's three denials that we're all familiar with and see what is the main point that Luke is trying to teach us this morning. Let me put it to you this way. Here's the main thrust of this passage. The main thrust of this passage is as follows. Like Peter, the pathway to denial has clear signposts, but denial is never beyond the restoring grace of Christ. Let me repeat that. Like Peter, the pathway to denial, which is the title of my message, has clear signposts along the way. But denial is never beyond the restoring grace of Jesus Christ. Let's look at these signposts along the pathway to denial. Number one, we're going to look at the greater immediate context here of our text. Number one pathway, number one signpost on this pathway is boasting so much. Boasting so much. Look back in this chapter to verse 31 to remind you this 
interaction that Jesus had with Peter. So we're studying this interaction. We're studying the denials of Peter as a subplot to the main plot of Jesus Christ. But I'm going to pull the lens back a little bit before we pull the lens in a little bit. And then I'm going to pull it back again at the end. So you'll see the big picture of what's going on with Peter here. Luke 22, verse 31, Jesus is addressing Peter and he says to him, if you recall, when we studied this, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. That pronoun you and that verse is in the plural form. There's a little note in your Bible that you say that. So if you were studying this on your note, on your own, you can be able to see that. In other words, Jesus is saying, Simon, Simon, he's addressing Simon per se as the leader of the 12. Behold, Simon demanded to have you all. As we would say down south, y'all. Here we would say you guys. He's addressing the 12. He's addressing Simon, but he's the content of what he says is about the 12. Satan demanded to have not just you, Simon, but he demanded to have all 12 of you that he might sift all 12 of you like wheat. Then Jesus switches intentionally in verse 32. But I have prayed for you, Peter, singular. Satan has demanded to have all of you, all 12 of you, to sift all of you. But I, Peter, have prayed for you. Why? That your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, not if you will turn again, but when Christ guarantees it because of his prayer for him, what should you do? Strengthen your brothers. Strengthen the others whom Satan wants to sift as wheat also. Verse 33, Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Not just to prison, but to die for you as well. In this rendering of Luke with the personal pronoun you in verse 31 being plural, referring to all the 12 disciples, and the pronoun you being singular in verse 32, is consistent with Matthew's account. Don't turn there, but listen to how Matthew records that section. Matthew 26, 31 to 35. Then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. There it is. It's consistent with what Luke said. Satan has demanded to sift you, plural, all of you. According to Matthew, Jesus said, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him. Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly, I tell you, this very night, he's talking to Peter at this point, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter's response, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Luke's rendition says, yeah, not only am I willing to go to death for you, Lord, I'm more committed than the other 11. I, I'm willing to die for you, go to prison for you. And here he says, according to Matthew, I'm not going to deny you, even though you say so. What's amazing about that account, according to Matthew, is that Jesus says you will all fall away. Not just you, Peter, all of you are going to fall away. And then Jesus, secondly, backs that up with Scripture. <laughs> no, no, you got it all wrong, Lord. I know you're quoting the Old Testament, and I know you're the Son of God, but you're wrong. That's what's so amazing about Peter's boasting so much, because it was in light of what Jesus said would happen, and he backed it up, Jesus did, with the very Word of God. So that's the first signpost of denial, boasting so much. Second signpost, number two is praying so little. Not only was Peter boasting so much, I'm not like the others. I'm not going to deny you. I'll go to prison. I'll die for you. But he was praying so little. He wasn't the only one, actually. Look at our text in Luke 22 that we had studied before in the Garden of Gethsemane, verse 45. 
And when he rose from prayer, that is Jesus, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, the disciples who were there with him, by the way, were Peter, James, and John, the inner three, right? And he said to them, what? Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray. Why? That you may not enter into temptation. <laughs> you had just boasted, Peter, so much that you're unlike the rest of the 11, that you're not going to deny me. You'll go to prison. You'll die for me. And you're about to face this temptation, and you're not in prayer about it. He was praying so little. That's the obvious signpost of a downward spiral towards denial. Number three, the third signpost in this pathway to denial, acting so impulsively, acting so impulsively. That's in verse 49 to 50 of our chapter. He was acting so impulsively. And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. And we know from John's account of that, that that person was Peter. John 18, verse 10, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. But why did Peter act so impulsively? Yes, he acted impulsively, as he did most of the time, did he not? But in this case, why did he do that? Because he had not realized the father's plan for the son's crucifixion on the cross. Jesus makes that clear in John 18, verse 11, after the text says in John's account that Simon Peter drew and struck the high priest's servant. Verse 11 of John 18, So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? I just... In my humanity, submitted and surrendered to the will of the Father to drink the cup of his wrath. This is why I came. And you're doing this because you have not realized that. That's why you're acting so impulsively. And now to our very text. So not only was Peter boasting so much, he was praying so little, he was acting so impulsively. But now, as we will see this morning, number four, denying so readily. Denying so readily. As we will see, he wasn't hesitant at all in his denials. Verse 54, where we pick up in our text. Then they seized him. This is in the garden. They seized Jesus and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. Now to understand, I showed you the sheet that Christ's trials are before, his religious trials are before Annas and Caiaphas. They are high priests. To understand who the priest that Luke is referring to, we have to cross-reference it with John's account. And John tells us this in John 18. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. So first, that's why you have it in your chart, Jesus was first taken in his trials to Annas. And he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Then he came before Caiaphas. Annas was Caiaphas' father-in-law. And John tells us that Caiaphas was a high priest that year. On paper, it was Caiaphas, historically. But Annas was in a major way still acting as high priest. So they were both. And he brings him where, does he say? Into the high priest's house. Matthew says, Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. So they bring him to the high priest's house. This is Caiaphas, the second in your chart. After he goes before Annas, after Jesus' is trial before Annas, he comes to Caiaphas. And when he comes there, the scribes and the elders were already there. They had already gathered. What does that mean? They were already plotting against Jesus. Have we not seen that in Luke? They have consistently, intentionally, premeditatingly plotted against the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 54 continues, and Peter was following at a distance. So in our account, in your chart, 
where it says they brought him before the high priest, that's Caiaphas. But the first denial, like I said, Luke is just giving this all at once. The first denial happens before he comes, before Jesus comes before Caiaphas. It's when Jesus is before Annas, Caiaphas' father-in-law. Peter was following at a distance. Matthew's account puts it this way. Then all the disciples left him and fled. So at this stage, when Jesus is taken and arrested and bound and is put on trial, what happens to the others? They're gone. Now, Judas is completely out of the picture at this point. The other ten have fled, Matthew says. But at least Peter didn't run away. He followed. We don't know why. Maybe he was just curious to see what was going to happen to his master. But Luke's point is that, look, the others fled. The others left Jesus. But Peter was at least following. But he was following, notice, at a distance, Luke says. Was it maybe he didn't want to be spotted? And, and notice, I'll follow. I want to know what's going to happen to Jesus. But Or maybe was he being apprehensive? Maybe what I said to Jesus, I'm not so committed to that anymore. We don't know. Luke doesn't get into the motives. But what Luke's point is, whereas the others are not there, Peter is there. He's following even though it's at a distance. That's his point. Verse 55. And when they had kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. So if you can picture the courtyard area, if you turn on the back of your white sheet that you have there, you'll see kind of what's happening. Just to give you a picture, because as Luke writes these things geographically, and locationally, what is going on? What courtyard? I thought Jesus was with Annas and then with Caiaphas. Yes. So you'll see number one in the upper right there of your sheet. There is the Garden of Gethsemane where they bound him and arrested him. And they brought him, number two, to the palace of the high priest, which would be uh, Caiaphas. And Annas would be there as well. And then three, the palace of Herod, which we'll examine as we go through this. Then Herod, Antipas, and then back to uh, Pilate again. And all of this is there. But as all these things are taking place in your sheet that you see there, there's open courtyard space. So while Jesus is before the high priest, at this point with the first denial before Annas, Peter is hanging around with everybody else around the courtyard. And Luke tells us that there's a fire that's been kindled in the middle of the courtyard. And he is among them. It's interesting that the verb there in verse 55, that Peter sat down among them, is the imperfect tense. That simply means... He didn't just go and sit down and then walk away. He was there for some time. He was there for some time. And notice the first denial in verse 56. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light. Remember, it's 2 or 3 in the morning now, a.m. It's dark. And what does the text tell us? According to Luke, the doctor who was very meticulous about what he wrote, they had kindled the fire. It's dark now, 2 to 3 a.m. in the morning. So this servant girl sees him in the light. You know, as you ever sit around a campfire, I experienced that again this summer when we were at camp. You know who's there, kind of, but you can't really see all the faces. But then the, the firelight hits off of a person's face, the glow of it, and oh, oh yeah, that's so-and-so. And that's what happened here. He's trying to stay at a distance, but he still wants to be among them to hear what's going on. And this servant girl, in the context of this, fire that was lit sees him and recognizes him and the text says looks closely at him and said this man also was with him verse 57 but he denied it saying woman I do not know him now what did the servant girl say you are with him what, what would you say in the day and culture that we live in, and we'll get to that application at the end. Or you're one of them. You're one of them fanatics. You're one of them Christians. He is, as Luke points out here, guilty, Peter is, by association. This man was also with him, she said. Why did Jesus choose the disciples? Mark chapter 3, verse 14 tells us that the purpose Jesus chose the 12 was that they might be with him. 
And we know that was the case because then later on in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4, verse 13, talking to Peter and John, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. She says, I know you. you you've been with him too. I saw you hanging out with him. Peter's response, woman, I do not know him. No hesitation whatsoever. He denied so readily. So readily. What's significant is the term that he uses, that Peter uses, that Luke records. When Peter says here to the first person, this servant girl, I do not know him, the term know is not the common Greek term used in the New Testament, which means to know somebody intimately or personally by their own personal experience. That's the more common term. That's not the term Peter uses. The term that Peter uses means to not know about something, information. So what Peter is saying, what he's denying is, I don't know about him, never mind knowing him in a personal and intimate way. You see? That's even a stronger denial. I don't, Peter is admitting, well, I don't forget about knowing him intimately and personally from my own personal experience. You have associated me with, with him. I don't even know about this guy. That's how strong his denial was. Second denial, verse 58. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. Denying so readily. Yet again, no hesitation whatsoever. Third denial continues in verse 59. And after an interval of about an hour, so an hour has gone by, that's important to notice. You think maybe he's thought about what he just said to the cervical and to the second denial. He had an hour to think about it. Still another insisted, the text says, saying, certainly this man was also with him. And why does this man say so? For he too is a Galilean. He had picked up on that. But Peter said, verse 60, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. There was no delay in what Christ said to Peter would happen on his third denial. The third witness in his denial sparks Peter as a Galilean. He's unmistakably certain of this. Certainly this man was with him. But Peter, without hesitation, again, denied Jesus so readily. Boasting so much. I'm not like the rest of them. I'm committed to death, to prison. I'll never deny you. Praying so little, acting so impulsively, not realizing God's intent for this cross. And now he's denying so readily. In part five of our text, we get to is the pathway to denial and the aftermath of it as well is remembering so vividly. Number five, remembering so vividly. Verse 61, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine that look? The gaze of the master, the son of man, who came to seek and to save the lost. Now looking at Peter. But, but how would that happen? I thought Peter's in the courtyard, around the fire with the servant girl and the others. Jesus is on trial, first before Annas and now before Caiaphas. How did that happen? Good question. If you look at the chart of the geographic location of everything taking place. So as Peter's coming, as Jesus rather is coming from, they're taking him from Annas, the high priest, who's not officially the high priest, but is still acting as high priest, to the palace of the high priest, which you see is number two there, they have to go through the open courtyard as it goes from one location to another. And as Jesus is being transferred, as you see in the back of your chart, the th second and third denials happen between Christ before Annas and Christ before Caiaphas. That's when the second and third denials happen. So as Christ is being brought from Annas to Caiaphas, 
the official high priest, he happens to see him in the courtyard at that exact time. It's interwoven in the denials of Peter. And Peter remembered, verse 61 says, the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. That look, that gaze of Jesus. Commentators go on and on to describe what kind of look was it? Was it a look of compassion? Was it a look of wrath? What kind of look was it? Was it a look of like, hey, I told you so. Well, we'll know at the end what kind of look it was. Luke doesn't tell us, but John does. So we see here, Peter is remembering so vividly. And number six, we see along this pathway, weeping so bitterly. Weeping so bitterly. Verse 62, as our text ends, and he went out and wept bitterly. Now you say, well, I, I've never done that. I, you've never, met, might never have somebody come up to you, as I said earlier, and said, are you, are you a Christian? Are you one of them? Uh, our, our denials come in different shapes and forms today. Our denials might be that we didn't speak up about the gospel when we had an opportunity to speak up, and we, we say this, well, God didn't open a door for me. And I say, he cracked the window. But we just subside back and go to bed with a clean conscience because of that. Peter was directly confronted with that. But what's the end of the story? Let's turn to John 21 to get the full picture of what happened to Peter in this subplot during Christ's trials. John 21 Verses 15 to 17, three verses. And this is under the last heading, number seven, restoring so graciously. Which will kind of infer and imply the kind of look and gaze Jesus had to Peter. Restoring so graciously. The subject of all the first six was Peter, right? Boasting so much, that was Peter. Praying so little, that was Peter. Acting so impulsively, that was Peter. Denying so readily, that was Peter. Remembering so vividly, that was Peter. Weeping so bitterly, that was Peter. But this last one, the subject is Christ. Restoring so graciously. Remember the main thrust of what Luke is trying to get that and in incorporating this into the trials of Jesus? Is that like Peter, the pathway to denial has many signposts, but it is never beyond the grace of Jesus Christ to restore. Let's see what he says to him here. John 21. This is post-resurrection. Jesus, in the context, appears to the disciples on the seashore. They go back to their old way of life. They had left their nets to follow him, and Peter and the others are back fishing again. And when they had finished breakfast, verse 15 of John 21 says, Jesus said to Simon Peter, the others are there as well, but he's addressing Simon, the leader. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, ergo, therefore, feed my lambs. Notice they are, Christ highlighted, my lambs. Not your lambs, they are my lambs. Verse 16 he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. You're to be the under shepherd of my lambs, of my sheep. You love me? Well, tend to them, feed them. Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved. Why? Because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. Peter's acknowledging the omniscience of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now you read that in the English text and you say, well, did Jesus not believe Peter? He was not taken in Peter at his word. Peter vividly said, you know that I love you. Yes, I do, Lord, I love you. This is Jesus restoring Peter after his denial. 
How many times did Peter deny him? How many times did Jesus ask him? Three. That's one reason. Another reason is in the Greek, there are four words for the Greek, for the English word love. You have to pick up, go on Duolingo and pick up Greek. It's a great language. Four words in the New Testament that's used for love. The ones that are used in this text in John 21, where Christ is restoring Peter so beautifully, so graciously, when Jesus asks him the first two times, Simon, do you love me? He uses the ultimate love word, agape. That's a John 3.16 love. For God so loved the world. That's the commitment, the loyal, the chesed love, the love of God that's unconditional and committed and sacrificial. When Peter responds both those for a time, for first two times, he says, yes, I love you, phileo. Where he gets Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It's a lower form of love. I, I, I'm your friend. I, I love you in that kind of way. But not in a sacrificial kind of way that you're asking me to. Jesus asked him again the second time, do you love me? Do you agape me? Yeah, I phileo you. The third time, Jesus switched it around to get Peter's attention. And he says, do you phileo love me? Peter said, yes, I do. Okay, then feed my sheep, tend my lambs. Christ is restoring Peter for his denial to be the leader of Christ's body, his flock, as the New Testament church unfolds as we see in the book of Acts. So why did Jesus appear here in John 21? There was a two reasons. It was proof, first of all, of what we believe doctrinally and theologically, the truth, the historical truth of what? The bodily resurrection of Jesus. We don't believe that he rose as a spirit. He rose bodily from the dead because on the seashore, it says here he ate breakfast with him. They had fish. But the second reason this is recorded in Scripture, as it relates to our text, why am I bringing this in? is to show that despite Peter's denial, Jesus restored him so he can be the one who initially leads Christ's sheep and Christ's flock, as we see unfolded in the book of Acts. How gracious is the Lord Jesus Christ? So what lessons can we learn from this practically? What's this have to do with you and me come Monday morning? Let me give you six practical lessons. Lesson number one. We're all like Peter. In one way or another, we're all like Peter. So are the other disciples. Are like Peter too, because Luke doesn't record it, but Matthew does. Matthew's account says, Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And then Matthew continues in the text, he says, and all the disciples said the same thing. But why is Peter highlighted? Because he is the leader of the 12. It is to Peter, he said, I will build my church, your Petros, and I will build my church upon this rock, Petra. The disciples did the same thing. We're all like Peter in one way or another. Second lesson we can learn is this. An apostate, by definition, an apostate, by definition, is one who is not truly saved, who totally and finally falls away from the faith, who denies the Lord and never returns back. So Peter was not an apostate, according to the definition of what an apostate is. Did he deny the Lord? Yes, but he returned back. The Lord restored him. An apostate is somebody who, like the parable of the sower, the seed fell on different soils, and some of them initially received it with joy, and there was seemingly outward evidence of positive response to the truth of the gospel. Uh, they were enthused, or they picked up a track at the booth, at the Menden Fair, or whatever it is. And God can use all that. But apostate is one who in the end finally and totally falls away from the faith by permanently denying the Lord, never returning back. Jesus talked about this in Luke chapter 12, verses 8 and 9. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Quite an amazing statement by Christ. What we acknowledge of Christ here 
ultimately he will acknowledge before God and the angels of heaven. The third lesson we can learn practically is this. Self-righteous confidence in your own spiritual maturity will make you susceptible to a fall. Let me repeat that. Self-righteous confidence in your own spiritual maturity makes you susceptible to a fall. Now, biblical truth is important. It's foundational, as I said when I spoke on the issue of the doctrine that is essential to our Christian faith and upbringing and our growth and maturity in Christ. But never get to the point where you say, I'm so mature and you're overconfident in your own maturity that you say, that could never happen to me. I would never do that. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says the following, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Self-righteous confidence in your own spiritual maturity will make you susceptible to a fall. You are not to boast in self. That's where it all began, as I showed you. Peter was boasting so much in himself. I think I've shared this with you before. I wanted to make public testimony to realize that when I graduated seminary, I got to the end of that particular chapter in my life, and it was only by the grace of God. And I had on my cap the reference, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, where the Apostle Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. If in your testimony, if you're a genuine, bona fide Christian this morning who is trusting in Jesus Christ alone, you can never get away from that. Your testimony, as well as everybody, every Christian testimony throughout the history of God's people and of mine, is that by the grace of God, you are what you are. Don't ever forget that. So what are we to boast about? If we're not to boast about in self, the Bible says we are to boast in four things. Number one, you are to boast, you and I are to boast in this. Number one, that you know and understand who God is. Not in a bragging kind of way. I know God better than you do. No. Not at all. In humility, listen to Jeremiah chapter 9. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. So if that's what we're to boast about, that would motivate our aim and goal in life is to know him more and more. The second thing we are to boast about, the scripture says, we are to boast, number two, in the Lord. In the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 29 to 31. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Where's the wisdom that we've received? The righteousness that we've received? The sanctification, the redemption? Paul says, it's in the Lord. Therefore, it's only natural to boast in him. Because all we have is from him. The third thing we are to boast about. How are you doing in this area? You're to boast in your weaknesses. In your weaknesses. We like to boast in our strengths. But we grow through our weaknesses. How? 2 Corinthians 11 verse 30. Paul says, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 5. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. 2 Corinthians, same chapter, chapter 12, verse 9. You're familiar with this one. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Isn't that amazing? So that the power of Christ may rest upon me is to happen as I boast in my weaknesses. To shine forth 
his power. And the last thing we have to boast about, the scripture says in the cross, number four, Galatians 6, 14 is a reference. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the things we're to boast about, not in ourself. What's the fourth lesson we can learn? Number four, you cannot resist temptation without prayer because prayer is your utter dependence upon God. We had done a series briefly in Sunday school, and we spent a lot of time also in prayer during our Sunday school hour. And we talked about definitions of prayer. Prayer is talking to God. But prayer shows our utter dependence on God. To not to pray is basically to tell God, I'm good on my own. I don't need you. And that was Christ's point in the Garden of Gethsemane to the disciples and specifically to Peter before his denial. You cannot resist temptation without prayer. The fifth lesson, number five, what you can learn. As we saw at the end of our story, the grace of Christ to restore is greater than any failure. The grace of Christ to restore is greater than any failure. We said Peter was not a full-out apostate. We saw in the book of Luke, in our study of Luke, the work of God in Peter's life. In Luke 5, verse 8, when Christ came face to face with Peter, and he said, go cast your net. Lord, we've been fishing all night and have caught nothing. But because you said, I'll do it. And when he saw and realized who Jesus was, what was Peter's response then? But when Peter saw it, Luke 5, 8, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And we know later on in Luke 9, in his growth and maturity, Luke 9, 18 to 20, that we had studied. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, this is on the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples were with him and he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered what? The Christ of God. No hesitation. The grace of Christ is never too late to restore for many of our failures. In the last lesson, number six, humility is an essential quality for resisting the devil. That's where it all began. The pathway was he was boasting too much. Humility is an essential quality for resisting the devil. First Peter 5, verses 6 to 9, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Remember the words of Christ to Peter. Satan is asked to sift you like wheat. He's still doing that and trying that today. Humility is essential. But humility is not only essential for resisting the devil in your fight against sin and temptation and in your growth and your sanctification. Humility is essential to your initial salvation. Jesus said, unless you become like the children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you know without a shadow of a doubt today that you stand in a right relationship with God? And that's an important question because the Bible says we are all by nature enemies of God. The Bible says that we are all guilty as sinners, as charged. Do you know without a shadow of a doubt that you stand forgiven before a holy God, all of your sins, past, present, and future. May God give you the grace to humble yourself to come to that point. Because in humility, you must first realize that the God of the universe who created you and is the reason you live and move and have your being, even as you're breathing this morning, is a God who is thrice holy and he can't turn a blind eye to sin. He would cease to be God if he did so. And that we in contrast as humans are not only sinners, but we are corrupt to the very core of our being. That we are by nature, the Bible says, children of wrath. But the good news, that's what the term gospel means, is that Jesus sent a substitute who lived the perfect life that God the Father asks of each one of us. Jesus Christ did that. Who died as a substitute, taking the cup of God's wrath in our stead. 
And you need to turn away in humility, away from everything you might be claiming and clinging to as your means of salvation and turn and run by faith alone to Jesus Christ. But Christian, fellow pilgrim, we live in precarious times. You will be asked and you will face situations like Peter did if you haven't already, where you will be tempted to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. It might be not so outright at first. It might be from the back door. But our culture, as you know, is all against Christ, his church, and his word. But we are here for a reason. We are here to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. So as we face these times, I want to close with a quote to embolden you and encourage you. The word encourage means to give courage to. The word discourage is to zap courage from somebody. I want to encourage you in the times that we live in when you're faced like Peter did and even on more greater level and more intense level to deny the Lord Jesus Christ and not to stand up for him. I want to encourage you to be strong and courageous. I quote from a book that I read a couple of years ago called Strong and Courageous. And the authors say this, quote, many Christians are trying to decide where to stand. The prophet Elijah has a word for us. How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. First Kings 18. Until you see it in those terms, the authors say, you will not be able to operate Christianly. We contend, the authors say, that the church's widespread unwillingness to follow Jesus publicly has in part brought about our nation's trouble. Christians cannot point the finger and shirk responsibility for the rise of America's new religion. Perhaps the clearest way to articulate America's new religion is to see that we have turned to worship the creature rather than the creator. Man, the creature, is now God, but in our current situation, it is not exactly the individual man who is God. Rather, collectivist man is God. We are all in this God thing together. And you will come along or else. And if we are God together, what needs to happen? Well, there must be universal equality and uniformity that occurs among all peoples. Collectivist man being God cannot be divided. One may not have more or less than another. Such a reality is not only injustice in the new religion, it is blasphemous. We have not yet attained his glorious utopia, but one day, male, female, black, white, heterosexual, homosexual, insert your intersexual category of choice, will all have exactly the same belongings. If we just believe in ourselves, then all will come to pass. Why we we not believe in ourselves? After all, we are God. In our city, the authors write, a mural with a new take on the Lord's Supper was recently commissioned. In place of the apostles, it pictures various outcasts, including a transgender individual, a cross-dressing alcoholic, a little black girl, and a Middle Eastern mother with her child. A white megachurch pastor plays the part of Judas. True, I'm glad I'm not that. And I'm not white in no megachurch. But this is what they say happens in this mural. A white megachurch pastor plays the part of Judas, who has gotten up to leave the table. Jesus himself, listen, is portrayed as, quote, a vagabond black man showing how much value is hidden within those from whom many may expect little. While Jesus indeed gathers to himself the broken and the needy, it is not hard to see that this mural portrays much more. It is a depiction of America's new religion. You have the Lord's Supper with no Lord Jesus. He has been replaced with a mere human in whom we must see great value. The bread and the cup of the Lord's Supper, which symbolize Christ's body and blood for our salvation, has been replaced with a cheeseburger and soda. The former being offered to a street dog and the latter to a homeless woman. America's new faith manifests itself, the authors say, in many ways. In the unrest of 2020, white people and police officers washed the feet of black leaders asking for forgiveness. In another case, a Black Lives Matter representative who was white, approached a white woman on the street 
telling her to kneel and apologize for her whiteness. She did so working hard to make sure she gave an honest and accurate confession. During the 2020 riots, instructions were given to mark your entrance with, quote, minority owned to protect your store from looting. The new religion is nothing to fear. God is worthy of our reverence and fear, but not the hardened secularism that manifests itself in the immature civil leadership, social interactions, and art that is mentioned above. We do not mean, however, that following Jesus amid the increase of our nation's worldliness will be easy. We regularly hear from Christians who suffer ridicule, shame, loss of employment, and many other challenges due to the spirit of the age. If the trajectory holds, then more trouble will come. One thing is certain. We are not free to back away from following Jesus. At bottom, America has nothing we want, and we have nothing she can take. We are the blood-bought children of God, called to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We will not do Christ's work in a corner because of America's new religion. And the authors close with the passage of scripture that I studied with the men this week, Joshua 1. And as you will be faced in whatever capacity to deny the Lord Jesus like Peter was, remember these words. Be strong and courageous. For you shall call this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Father, we rest on the promise that you have made to us that despite the trouble that we face in our day and the temptations to deny the Lord Jesus that, like Peter did, you have promised to never leave us nor forsake us but that you will be with us wherever you go. Therefore, we will move forward with strength and courage. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.